So I just kind of made a list of questions that I thought this case raises, okay? I'm not going to tell you, you know, what the right or the wrong answer is. I think some of these, there simply are no right or wrong answers, but they're the very challenging questions. Um, and I think that regardless of, of how unfairly or, you know, um, compromising in process you may think Omar Khadr's case is, it doesn't in and of itself make some of these questions any easier to answer. So I'm going to kind of raise the questions and then maybe that'll help us have a discussion later. Um, there is the whole discussion of child soldier versus transnational terrorist illegal combatant. Okay? And by the way, I don't think this is just an Afghanistan question. It's not just a post 9-11 question. I think this is a combat in the 21st century question. Okay? Um, because these, this is just the nature of contemporary conflict. Whether you're talking about the, you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo or Darfur, or anywhere else, um, you're go you know, anywhere that you have irregulars, irregular fighters of one sort or another, you may choose to call them, you know, not violent sub-state actors, you may choose to call them terrorists, choose your terminology you will, but the questions aren't going to go away. Um, essentially, right now, we have, a, I would say, a, 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 both an overlap and a lacunae. This sounds kind of contradictory, but we have sort of a gap and an overlap in law with respect to what are these people, okay? We have the Geneva Conventions, which as you may know were designed in 1949, you know, long series of negotiations leading up to them. And they were really designed with state conflicts in mind and state actors. There are additional protocols that were negotiated much later. Some countries are, are signatory to them, some countries are not, but the more universally recognized are the four Geneva Conventions. And in, under those original four conventions, you're either a civilian or you're a combat combatant. There's no kind of space in between. The only way you can sort of find a space in between is the Geneva Convention 3 says that um, civilians can be targeted for such time they take part in hostilities. Okay? And this has led to some really interesting legal questions about what is for such time, what's the time element, how can that be stretched, and what does taking part in hostilities mean? There's been a really interesting, by the way, jurisprudence by the Israeli Supreme Court on exactly this issue. If somebody drives somebody um, to a place where they're going to be doing some fighting but is involved in fighting themselves, um, and does that mean that they're taking part in hostilities? Are they um, considered to be targetable in that sense? And when are they targetable? Are they targetable the next night while they're sleeping in their bed? Are they only targetable when they're actually taking part in hostilities if that's in fact what they're doing? It's very confusing. Yes? Could you apply that, if you would, to Afghanistan and the people who are fighting against uh, Canada and America? Sure. And so. So what, right now we're dealing with a de facto category in law that doesn't officially exist, okay? Um, and by the way, our Canadian detainee agreements pretty much presume this. So we presume something that is a non-existent category. Um, and it, and you know, I mean, it got called, they got called, you know, like roughly and kind of somewhat, I don't know, um, in a media spectacular sort of way by the Bush administration as enemy combatants. The, the more, I would say, toned down terminology would be to call them unprivileged belligerents. So what happens if you're not really a civilian and you're not a traditional state actor combatant? And you're a farmer during the day and you take up a gun at night. That's right. That's right. You know, absolutely. What, what does that make you? Okay. And what body of law gets applied to that? Because the Geneva Conventions don't quite apply. And lo a local, domestic, whatever the domicile is of what you're talking about, criminal law is really tricky because often you're dealing with places that, let's just say, don't have quite the state capacity for enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, to deal with that situation. And you know, the 1949 Geneva Conventions assumed something really important. They assumed that the losers would be content to be losers. <laughs> no, seriously, this is really important, right? So they expected when unconditional surrender was signed with Germany and Japan, the expectation was the German, you know, soldier wasn't going to go fight an insurgency, you know, in Charlottenburg on the edge of Berlin. They were going to, like, go back to life. They were going to accept the loser status, okay? I mean, just to put it in contemporary language. And it was a safe assumption at that time. I think in contemporary conflict, 
Um, asking losers to be losers is not something we can safely assume. Okay, so that, that's tricky. Now, again, this is a, this is a question that, that Catter's case raises. It may be totally inapplicable to Catter, again, because of his age, and that raises all kinds of issues, but the issue itself doesn't go away. And it doesn't go away with pulling the troops out of Afghanistan or anything else. It's, a, it's an ongoing problem. Okay. Um, of course, the other problem that, that, uh, that the case raises is, let's just say you capture folks, whatever you want to call them, where do you put them? I think probably most would say that Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay was, if not a legal failure, which I think it probably is, then minimally it was a policy failure, okay? Um, and I think, you know, that was reasonably demonstrated by the fact that President Obama said he was going to, you know, close the place within 100 days of becoming president. And when he got into that job, you know, it's like you become president, you think your ability to act is between here and here. And then once you actually get in the job, you find that your sort of lane of potential action is much narrower, right? So, I mean, you could even decide that some of those guys weren't going to be tried. And you could decide that they were wrong place, wrong time guys and that some injustice had been done, but that still raises the question is what to do with them. Okay, like, what do you do with the Chinese Uyghurs in Guantanamo? This is a group of people who are from a part of China, and it's reasonably assumed that if these guys are sent back to China, it's game over for these guys. So weirdly, they're safer off in Guantanamo. I mean, that's not something we'd like to think about, but it's true. Now, the idea was we're going to try and get other countries to sort of take the Uyghurs. Again, this is not just a, a counter case, but it, it shows the bigger issue. Um, and, you know, we, you know, the Americans got Kosovo to take a lot of them because after Kosovo was a new state and the Americans kind of supported them, so they had a bit of leverage with Kosovo. Here, have some Uyghurs. Um, but that only went so far. So, you know, um, Catter's case, you know, again, leaving aside the question of his status, uh, whether or not he was in fact guilty of anything, um, it still raises the, the question of what do you do with people. And then, of course, you have the whole issue of enhanced interrogation uh, or torture. And uh, what do you do with evidence that's obtained under such methods? Do you assume that, you know, there's a legal doctrine called the fruit of the poison tree, right? If you, if it, if it's gotten by sort of um, nasty means, then it's discarded, absolutely. And our own charter, you know, and, and this is to do with criminal law too, you know, domestic criminal law. If, some, if there's some, some illegality about the way in which a police officer interrogates somebody, and that that is argued before a court, the judge will rule that that portion of the evidence is inadmissible, okay? Um, and that's, by the way, one of the reasons why it would be almost impossible to try Catter for crimes that he may or may not have committed in Afghanistan, in Canada, because virtually all of the evidence would not stand up to charter scrutiny. So even if you think, well, he might sort of be guilty of something, but totally agree with the fact that there's procedural fairness issue with the Guantanamo, how come we can't just have a trial here? It's not possible. Now here's the really sad and horrible irony. If Omar Khadr had been picked up on the battlefield, and handed over to Canadian authorities and brought back to Canada then, you know, because we have, you know, um, domestic war crimes and we have a whole history of trying people for war crimes, the things that have happened overseas have happened here, you know, there could have been some legal process. And by the way, the whole issue of his age and responsibility and all the rest of it would have been discussed. But it could have been done here. Yes. Is there no statute of limitations on these things apply because so much time has passed? Not for war crimes. In Canada, not for any crimes, I don't think. Not for even uh, misdemeanors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are. I don't know. But anyway, certainly not for war crimes. I mean, we we've had you know the Emory Finta case a number of years ago. This was uh, you know um, uh, an alleged. Um, a Holocaust perpetrator from Hungary, okay, and the trial was in the 90s. So, no, it was like years and years and years later. So, absolutely, you're, you're totally okay there. Um, so that's, um, that's another one of the questions that's raised by this case. Um, there's a whole issue of secret evidence. Um, you know, not just was it, was it illegally um, obtained by interrogation slash torture, um, but some of it is withheld from the defendant himself. Okay, now this is a huge uh, due process violation. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the issue with Catter's case. You know, when is a plea bargain really a plea bargain? You know, to what ex when 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 Catter pleads guilty, did he plead guilty because he really felt that you know, okay, fine, it's time to give up the ghost. I killed that dude, and you know, this is um, what I'm going to have to do. Or did he plead guilty because he thought, as a scared 20-something who'd spent almost 10 years in um, a detention facility. Um, did he plead guilty because he figured it was the only means possible of getting back to Canada? Okay, I mean, what, where's the element of duress in that? Um, you know, we don't really know. Okay, then there are some, I think, very specific, so those are big questions. Then I think there are some very specific Canadian questions, one of which is the extraterritorial application of the Charter. And this is a really interesting discussion in law. Yes? Going, I just want to go back five seconds. Yes. To your question about plea bargain. Isn't that true in any plea bargain situation? Sure. But most plea bargains don't happen with people that are that, well, have been incarcerated for that long um, in what could hardly be described as a youth criminal justice facility, right? So, um, yes, you're right. That's absolutely a case. But the circumstances here are considerably more severe. Okay? So it's one thing to have that discussion because you're out at Metro West Detention Center, and it's quite another discussion to be to have this to be happening in Guantanamo Bay. Okay, so that's uh, that's the case. So extraterritorial application of the Charter, um, and this is a really this is a really kind of interesting development in law. This may be something, Gavin, you're the lawyer, you can talk about it more than I can, but. Um, uh, you know, there's been a, a kind of a trend in this direction, okay, over time. And I'm not going to get into all the cases, but one of the other cases that gets re that's relevant to all of this is the, um, the whole uh, litigation that happens, um, re which put forward by the BC, Liber BC Civil Liberties Association with respect to detainee policy in Afghanistan. And in that case, um, the argument was, you know, these are Canadian soldiers operating abroad, you know, supposedly cognizant of, you know, not only the charter, but also something broader that we like to call charter values, and that, you know, their actions um, are definitely in violation of that. I mean, that's, that's how the argument goes. Um, in that case, it was dismissed by the Supreme Court because there wasn't that, you know, nexus of Canadians operating abroad and Canadians who are having their charter rights violated. So, you know, you know, had there been a Canadian who had volunteered, maybe much older than Omar Khadr, that got, you know, joined the Taliban and got picked up at the battlefield and his rights were compromised in some way by some kind of handover, then in that kind of situation, I think the court would have viewed it somewhat differently. Again, you need that nexus of Canadian officials and Canadians abroad. Okay, one of the counter decisions raised another very interesting question, and that's the whole question about Crown prerogative. Okay, there was a whole issue with, the, with one of the counter cases about the remedy. Okay, the, the, the court was very clear on the fact that Catter's charter rights had been violated, but the court felt quite constrained in terms of what it could do about that, in terms of ordering a remedy, because foreign policy in this country is the sole prerogative of the Crown. Okay, so in a sense, the executive arm of government. And the Crown and the courts obviously felt very uncomfortable with going against that very long tradition of Crown prerogative. And that's the way the, the federal government fought it before the court. Okay, and they, on that point they won. So the court ended up with this really weird kind of decision where yes, the rights are all violated, but we're going to ask the government to please remedy this right away. But they didn't tell them how to do that. Okay? Yes? How bad did the U.S. want to keep him where, they, where he was in Guantanamo? You know, regardless of what Canada yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually think that, that Omar Khadr became this kind of weird football, right? I mean, I think, I mean, it did not look good no. for the Obama administration to have one of the very first military commission cases to be a 15-year-old, you know, the guy who at the time was, you know, a 15-year-old Canadian kid. Like, this, this did not play well, okay? And it's funny, because do, I'm doing a lot of research now on post-9-11 terrorism and security law in the United States. And, you know, if you ask them about, I mean, they've never heard of Momin Kawaja, they've never heard of the Toronto 18, but I'll tell you, most people who are sort of in the know about these things, they've heard of Omar Khadr. Yeah. Okay, it's something that's well known. I mean, I think the situation, I mean, if I could imagine 
you know, a behind closed doors conversation between o Obama and his advisors and Harper and his advisors, I would say that Obama really, really wanted to get rid of him, but didn't want to ask Canada to take him. It, they really wanted Canada to, to just take him, okay? And Harper um, really, really, really didn't want to take him, really wanted the Americans to say, take him. <laughs> so like they're both in a situation where, and this kid is, you know, stuck in the middle. But, you know, he's a kind of a political football or a hot potato that gets thrown up in the air and nobody really wants to deal with it. Yep. Fidel would have taken better care. Pardon me? Fidel would have taken better care. Probably. <laughs> under more international scrutiny. What does that mean? <laughs> and American pressure. What does that mean? Well, he's referring to presumably if he was under Fidel Castro's care. Because Guantanamo Bay is in Cuba. I'm assuming that was your pun. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Just going on there. Um, and then there's a whole issue of, and this is a really serious, hard set of questions. So this goes beyond, I would say, Omer Catter the kid, and really goes to the heart of, you know, the Catter family. Okay, and this is what I think, when people still get very incensed about Catter, they're really not getting incensed about Catter, I think they're getting incensed about the Catter family. And what that may or may not represent, okay? Um, we have on the one set, a very strong set of Canadian values, of multiculturalism, which is, you know, enshrined in our Charter of Rights, you know, diversity, tolerance, and so on. It's, it's part of who we are as a country, and it's particularly woven into the fabric of the city, and it's really important, and I think it's a, a great source of Canadian and municipal pride. Um, but then we know that there is a kind of dark, ugly flip side to that, okay? And we've seen it bubble up in different ways. And, and by the way, this is not just a post 9-11, you know, let's point the finger at Muslims problem, okay? This is a larger issue. I mean, I mean, I first really began to pay attention to this issue myself as a scholar during the wars of the Yugoslav succession in the 1990s, okay? You know, few people know that the former Croat Minister of Defense was a pizza parlor owner from Ottawa. Okay, and he was planning military strategy while he was like, you know, dealing with pizza ingredients from the comfort of his Ottawa restaurant. Okay, that's a bit of a challenge. And there's a ton of fundraising, by the way, that happens in Canada for those wars. So it's expatriate communities that have a kind of a fro, and you know, anyone that's, fr that's been involved in the kind of tricky politics of an immigrant community will know that, that often the politics of the homeland get frozen and transported to you know, whatever neighborhood in Toronto, and you know, people can, it's easy to be an armchair warrior because it's, your, it's a very comfortable place to be, right? So that's a real problem. Um, human Rights Watch, you know, a very, you know, impeccable, you know, human rights organization out of New York, shone a huge light on the Tamil community in Canada many years ago because there was a lot of LTTE fundraising and extortion going on, and a lot of fear for uh, local Tamils in Canada because they felt, um, you know, in some level of um, duress to contribute and to partake in that. But you know what, I mean, and, and this isn't just Canada. I mean, you can go back to, you know, IRA fundraising in the pubs in Boston in the 1970s. Okay, this is, this is a much bigger problem, okay? But I think uh, the case raises that, you know, to what extent do we have to be concerned that people use Canadian passports, which are very, very desirable, as passports of convenience, and then use the safety of Canada and the relative open society of Canada as an opportunity to, you know, fundraise, support, raise issues, whatever. Yes? Just wondering, like, if, and I'm not a lawyer, but if I was his lawyer and someone brought that up, I'd say, what does it have to do with my client? I mean, I know in the media, I know Ezra Levant brings it up, and I know yep. blah, blah, blah brings it up, but I mean, I would just go, okay, next subject. You know, like, I... Agree, agree. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. People don't look at Omar Khadr by looking at Omar Khadr. Often people look at Omar Khadr through the lens of his family. Okay? And this, and this is a really troubling issue. I mean, I mean, my pushback to that is, to what extent do you, you know, do you, um, do you put the, son, the sins of the father upon the son? I mean, to me, it's a moral. It's always almost a moral ethical but, question. But isn't it that if he were a child, if he were under the influence of his father, when yep. he, allegedly he threw the hand grenade, that yep. therefore he could be looked at as a child soldier. Absolutely, 
Absolutely. But this gets tricky, too, because, you know, the whole definition of child soldiers is, is a very tricky and elastic and amorphous one because it goes to the heart of that problem with the Geneva Conventions. Okay. Now, it's certainly fair to say that when we looked at, just one sec, when we looked at, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, DRC, D Democratic Republic of Congo, huge child soldier problem, um, you know, they haven't worried terribly about, hmm, was there any fixed insignia? Were they carrying arms openly? Did they, you know, function under the laws of war? I mean, these are, these are the, you know, the distinctions that are in the Geneva Conventions to determine whether or not you're a soldier or whether or not you're a civilian, okay? People recognize in those conflicts that it's very messy um, and it's, and uh, therefore, and there's a huge amount of abuse and duress and, um, you know, violence and sexual assault and a lot of other things going on. And it's really unclear and really almost impossible to suggest that the kids in those situations have any kind of agency or choice or ability in very difficult circumstances to kind of ex have an exit strategy for the activities they're involved in. And quite often at very strong personal risk to themselves and their families. So, you know, we, we, we have all kinds of sympathy there, but we have less sympathy in the Catter case. So there is clearly a double standard uh, in operation. I think I'm just going to leave it there for now because Gavin has some very specific things to say about his report and then maybe we can make it bigger. Do you have one question? Sorry. I stopped you. Double-hander. Yeah, double-hander. <laughs> yes, you wanted to pump in. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but firstly, I think your uh, reference to the IRA and yep. the uh, Croatians and the Catalan, <coughs> I think it really says that when people immigrate, they don't immigrate without their political baggage. I mean, that's, that's Well, simple. and we, go, we take our political baggage everywhere. And, when, when you, and, and in a sense, you know, we, how can we, so people come from some of the hell holes of the planet to Canada. And, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. I celebrate our immigration and refugee policy. Um, I think we are net winners out of that situation, although some people can argue about that. But uh, my own view is that we're net winners. But how can you not expect people that have come out of really difficult situations to not bring some baggage? It's a really, you know, people have baggage. They have a lot of personal trauma. And, you know, it's hard to separate yourself from conflicts away. My, my question could be answered by you or the next speaker. What if Khader was an adult? How much of this story will still play out? Is it just because he's young or is it also something else? No, I think, I think... I think some of it's because of his young, but I think some of the issues, the issues of the interrogation, the, the secret <coughs> evidence, the larger questions about, you know, what are these people? Even if it was an issue of an age, we'd still have the, what are these people and what do we do with them in a battle space problem? I think that's a problem that's much bigger than, than Catter. I just wanted to bring it up because I think there's more going on here than just the child soldier thing. But we're just the child soldier thing. We could talk about that and pack up and go home. I think there's more stuff going on. Yeah, and then over here. How do we settle it? Um, well, uh, you bring him back. <laughs> oh. uh, well, one thinks that at a certain point in time that uh, Vic Taves runs out of good excuses for why the file is still sitting <laughs> on his desk. I don't know. Um, you know, I would have thought I would have thought that by now, you know, perhaps the American authorities would have said, you know, really, you know, take this kid away. Um, but, you know, these diplomatic niceties are, are very complex, and I appreciate that. But, um, I mean, I think eventually he's going to come back. The, the interesting question for me is, what interesting tricks do his lawyers have up their sleeves once he's back? Who's paying for Okay, all of I, I think we're going to save some of the questions till the end. We're going to move on with Gavin, and then we'll have time to Save those. After. Save those. They're good questions. Yeah. I'm sure they are. Thank you. They were good questions. I mean, I think particularly the distinction between civilians and soldiers is one that we have a really difficult time for. A fellow asked a question about it, and he said, you know, what about what's going on in Af Afghanistan, I think, and my first thought was, like, or Pakistan, and my first thought was like, yes, exactly. If an ununiformed CIA operative flies a drone over Pakistan and kills someone, that man is not a uniformed soldier, and under current U.S. doctrine, which has created this third 
third non-soldier, non-civilian category, uh, you know, that man's a warm criminal and we should ship him off to Guantanamo and hold him for 10 years without charge because right he is a non, he's an enemy combatant. He's not. He has no military rank at all. So I think that's a really interesting question, not just in terms of the fact that we know regular forces fight in, in foreign theaters, but in fact, the United States has irregular for, forces fighting in those, in those very theaters. And they don't really ask about how those people would be treated uh, when they try to create a system uh, three times over, as, as uh, of course, Professor Mayer, uh, they created a system under Bush. It was struck down by the Supreme Court in Hamdan versus Rumsfeld. They tried to create another one, then there was an election, so they created a third one. And uh, ultimately, uh, at least one of those systems is being struck down for being unconstitutional, and we certainly don't know about the third, but it doesn't have the hallmarks of a tribunal operating by the rule of law. So as I mentioned earlier, I uh, helped draft a report on behalf of Lawyers Rights Watch Canada to the Committee Against Torture. So a little bit of background, uh, and sorry, of course, I am also on the steering committee of Why Should I Care? Some people suggested earlier this might be some sort of conflict, but my sources assured me it was only a conflict of the city benefits. <laughs> so the, we, we prepared a report to the Committee Against Torture because Canada is a signatory to the Torture Convention. Uh, and so is the United States, by the way. And so that involves certain obligations, and we've actually encoded those obligations. So sometimes people say, well, what is all this about international law? What is this story about torture? And the story about torture starts with the torture convention. Um, but the most important aspects of that convention have been incorporated into Canadian law, particularly in the criminal code. So the criminal code of Canada defines torture as a law of universal jurisdiction, we can prosecute anybody who tortures anyone, anywhere, if they come to Canada. And we have a legal obligation to do so. Except George Bush. <laughs> yes, it turns out that in fact we don't follow those obligations. But I would say not just George Bush. We do know that four officials from the Foreign Affairs Department went down and participated in Omar Khadr's questioning when they knew him to be, have been subject to torture. So frankly, in my opinion, an investigation into those facts would probably support charges, criminal charges being brought up against those people for being complicit in torture. That's Canadian law. They broke the law, they committed torture, and they can be charged for that as soon as they set foot in Canada, as can any torturer or war well, criminal. Quick question. What yeah. specific forms of torture are verified as part of the subject? Uh, right, yeah, good question. So uh, they are uh, sleep deprivation, uh, prolonged solitary confinement, uh, confinement in stress positions and uh, waterboarding, although we don't know for sure that Omar Khadr was subjected to waterboarding. But the first three are all accepted definitions of torture at international law and Canadian law. So the answer is yes, he was 100% tortured because prolonged solitary confinement in and of itself is torture. And that's before you consider whether it's relevant that he was 16 years old, which under Canadian law and US law and international law is extremely relevant. But even if you personally don't consider it relevant, he was still tortured. <laughs>